Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service here at Mayfield Salisbury. Lovely to see you here in the church. Lovely to see you online too. Um, welcome as well to our morning worship uh, this morning. Everyone's most welcome too after the service to come through for tea and coffee, other refreshments through in the Bill McDonald Hall, through the door to my right. Um, do come through if you can. We will uh, worship together in the service mostly unannounced. It's all uh, in the order of service as we worship. One minor change, uh, entirely mea culpa, my own fault. Uh, the last hymn should be number 459. It is indeed crown him with many crowns. If you look at the number uh, that's in the order of service, you'll be in an entirely different place. So it's 459 and it's to the tune Dia Damata. Dia Damata, 459 for crown him with many crowns. We're approaching Lent, which begins on Wednesday. Hope you've got your uh, pancake mix ready for Tuesday, for Shrove Tuesday. And at the start of Lent on Ash Wednesday, that's coming up, we have a service together. If you'd like to mark the start of Lent in worship, a service together with folks at Priestfield, which is at seven o'clock at Priestfield on Wednesday night, on Ash Wednesday, 7 p.m. Everyone very welcome. Lent is a time for personal reflection in our lives, a time to think again about our faith and our relationship with Jesus Christ as we prepare over 40 days and 40 nights, as Jesus did in the wilderness, um, for the passion of Christ in Holy Week and for the joy of the resurrection on Easter Sunday. You might be in a period of brief respite if you set yourself some New Year's resolutions that have begun to drift to the wayside. You might have had a short while of full indulgence and now be thinking again of what you ought to give up come Wednesday. Uh, but if you are giving anything up on Wednesday over those five and a half weeks, it's not just for the sake of it, even though it might have its side benefits in your waistline maybe or your bank balance. Uh, it's to give ourselves away too. The idea is that uh, we refocus ourselves on what's important on the Lent journey, we deny ourselves and we take up our cross. Um, so, on this last Sunday before Lent, the church usually focuses on the transfiguration of Jesus. And if, it, if the passage itself and the sermon uh, don't really speak to you very much, there's one very visual depiction of the transfiguration in here that you may have noticed which is in the window over in the north transept. So if you're going past through for tea and coffee, you'll see it. And it depicts very visually uh, Christ in his dazzling white robes with Moses and Elijah beside him and Peter, James and John there in the scene too. So a very beautiful and visual depiction of it. Uh, if you are going through, you'll notice that uh, we have a fair trade stall this morning. So it's a cash only stall, but I'm sure if uh, you want to offer IOUs or bottle tops or buttons or some kind of promise to Alistair and Jean, they'd be very willing. So lots of offer there. So do stop at the fair trade stall on the way past. Um, coming up in the life of the church, uh, a reminder this week that all are welcome at our Tuesday prayers and at Thursday club, as well as a service of thanksgiving here tomorrow in the church at half past two for the life of the Reverend Ralph Smith. And if you knew Ralph, uh, you'd be most welcome to be here tomorrow afternoon at 2.30 for Ralph's service. I notice also on the order of service on Friday, we have a holiday club, a faith and fun morning for primary age children. Um, so if you'd like to sign anyone up for that, then please do, please do contact our youth worker, Bettina. Next Sunday, we uh, join together with friends at Peacefield and Craig Miller Park as Newington Trinity for a single service here at 10.30. So third Sunday of the month, we have our joint service. So it's one service next Sunday here at 10.30. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God into a world that is stained with conflict and with violence. Jesus calls us to be peacemakers. So before we offer our worship to him, if you'd wish, let us share his peace with one another, with those around us. May the peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you.
we say together our call to worship. We are not strangers. We are here as one family. We are not alone. We are gathered in one body. We are not forgotten. We are loved by Christ Jesus. We are not silenced. We are heard as God's people. Let us worship God. Hark the glad sound, the Savior comes. <laughs> Let us worship God in a few minutes' time <laughs> after we take a time for silence and the intro. We are not silenced. We are heard as God's people. Let us worship God. Hark the glad sound, the Savior comes.
Let us pray. Loving God, God of light and peace, your light shines upon us even at the darkest times. Your light guides us even in the hardest times of our lives. As stars in the night sky helped sailors to find their way in years past. When we know you, love you and trust you, God, your light brightens our paths, clearly showing us all that might bring us to harm, the many things of life that might trip us up or block our way, the things that might come between you and us, the things we could not see clearly if we lived away from the light of your love and word. We are grateful, God, that we have your light, for we know that little grows or can even survive in the darkness. It's a light that nourishes us, strengthens us, and brings us warmth and life, peace and comfort. When you created this light, God, you created it to be good, and that goodness permeates our very souls. But sometimes, God, your light can be so, so bright. When the brilliance of it shines upon us, it can make us want to turn away or hide in the darkness. For each of us carries with us a weight of things we have done wrong. Mistakes, pain, suffering and hurt things that we perhaps would not like others to see. But we know, God, that your light is so bright that you see all things. You know the things that can overwhelm us or make us feel guilty or ashamed. Your light is not there to shame us, God, but rather to remind us that nothing we have done is too much for you to forgive when we choose to accept your light and love. No pain or suffering that we have is not known to you. For your light, God, is the light of love. So bring your brilliance to us and change us, just as you changed Jesus as he stood on top of the mountain. Help us to learn to shine like you and with you for the world to see, just as you called us to and laid out for us in the words that Jesus taught us to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever amen
the Old Testament reading is from Psalm 50, starting at verse 1. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest all around him. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. New Testament reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, starting at verse 2, the Transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. For the word of God revealed through Scripture.
May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What might it be, I wonder, that would force you to cover your eyes from what you are seeing or to muffle your hands over your ears to block out what you are hearing? To say, I can't take this any longer Please make it stop, apart from the next 10 minutes of your life, of course. (laughs) Sensory overload will be different for each of us and might depend on where we stand on the great spectrum of neurodiversity that marks us as unique individuals, all made in God's image. For some, the sounds might be enormous power chords on an electric guitar played at Wembley Stadium volume, if you're more of an easy listening or smooth jazz kind of person. If you know the spoof movie, This is Spinal Tap, when all the amps are turned up to 11. Or it could be an ear-piercing scream from an upset child, or chalk scraped on a blackboard, or a knife running down a plate. For others, the sights might be flashing strobe lights at a concert. That certainly does it for me. Or a chaotic crowd going bonkers at a big sporting event like after the final whistle yesterday at Murrayfield. Or just the dazzling, brilliant light of the sun piercing our gaze. Remember that? I'm told it might happen in a few months' time. I wonder how we'd all fare with what's sometimes described as a theophany, a sudden visible manifestation of God appearing before our very eyes. Probably not very well, for in the Bible they don't tend to arrive with a polite excuse me or a tap on the shoulder, a wee whimper and a hint, a nod and a wink. The still small voice of God is reserved for other times. We have the words of Psalm 50 that Annetta read for us. 
of how the mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth. Our God comes, says verse 3, and does not keep silence, for before him is a devouring fire, and a mighty tempest is all around him. Anyone who ventured out last Friday will know the feeling. And then in our passage from Mark's Gospel, we find Jesus on the mountain top being transfigured, his clothes described as becoming a dazzling white, and the voice of God booming from a cloud, saying, This is my beloved. Listen to him. Theophanies in Scripture are full on. They are all in. They are far more thus spake Zarathustra than a bit of Eric Satie. They are more we are the champions than hush little baby, don't you cry. With all the noise and all the drama, the temptation might be to think that this is how God chooses to reveal God's self, then and only then. And if we've never seen a burning bush, a sea parted, a leper cleansed, or a curtain rent asunder, we've never really seen God, nor do we know who God is. But when we look at the bigger picture, away from these great barnstorming crescendos, we see that the whole of Scripture is actually a developing drama of how people are shaped by moments of revelation, moments of revelation of the identity of who God is, and as a result of their own identity as God's people. And it's in Jesus Christ that we have the ultimate revelation of who God is and who we might become, the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace. We might see these theophanies then as moments of high drama that encourage a leap forward. They encourage a propulsion on an onward journey through flashes of brilliant light. Just as there are transitions in the Old Testament for the people of Israel in moments of revelation of God, so this dazzling revelation of Christ's fullest identity at the transfiguration on top of Mount Tabor is a sudden moment of transition, a glimpse of what might be possible for all humanity. It might highlight the message, it might flash like a billboard on Broadway, but that message still needs to be lived out. And so this is Transfiguration Sunday, an experience for the disciples, Peter, James, and John on the mountaintop, an experience too for us, as his present day disciples, that we might call the trailer for the journey of Christ to the cross through Lent to Good Friday. God now is out in the open. God is speaking boldly and the gloves are off. For here, if you like, in the cacophony of the theophany, Jesus' identity is confirmed and proclaimed in God's word. He is the Son and the Beloved. It's a sudden, extraordinary glimpse, a foretaste of the divine. It is the moment, in Sarah Lowe's words, which broke the barrier between heaven and earth, for Jesus was the one who could belong to both at the same time, a citizen of heaven and a citizen of earth. A high spot when the reality of who Jesus really was dawned on the disciples. Suddenly they see it in a flash, in an instant, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Moses is there. That Jesus is the greatest of the prophets. Elijah is there. They realize that he is sent from God, dazzling in all his splendor. A brief vision of Christ in all his heavenly glory. A moment after which life will never be the same again, but not to hold on to forever. A transition then to propel them forward. For this isn't just a divine fireworks display at which we are to go up forever in awe or even in fear, as the disciples did for those brief moments. For faith is dynamic, it's always moving on. It's much more embarking and traveling than arriving. Through doubt and questioning, through hurt and struggle, through revelation and joy. 
As one theologian puts it, every moment of clarity with God is merely an invitation to the next question, to move onwards and take the next step. Some of us will have been to the mountaintop in our lives. We'll have seen clarity in the brilliant white light and heard the thunderous voice of God speaking in our lives, a theophany that reveals to us the identity of God or the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives unmistakably and forever. Others amongst us might feel, as in virtually every climb I have done on a Scottish mountain, more as if the cloud has descended about halfway up and all we can see is a shroud of rain and false summits. No booming voices there. Yes, this vision is seen by Peter, James and John on the top of the mountain. And Jesus has changed forever, not in who he is or what he does, but in how he is seen there, how his identity has been revealed. But that transition in that identity is linked not just to being there at the top of the mountain. That's why Peter's suggestion of building some shelters for them all at the top is scoffed at. But it's indelibly linked also to coming down from the mountaintop coming down into the shadows and the darkness of the valley, journeying towards Jesus' destiny on the cross in Jerusalem, that journey that we will begin to shortly in Lent. Down then for us as well, away from the mountaintop, if you've ever reached that summit, into the shadows of the valleys, into the shadows of war, into the shadows of personal pain and loss, from the mountaintop to valleys, but then onwards to Jerusalem, to the cross and the empty tomb, and to places of resurrection and peace, hope and new life for all humanity. Lent draws us into that invitation to become part ourselves of the discipleship story from the mountain to the tomb, living by faith, trusting the one who promises stepping out together onto the Jerusalem road. And as we make that walk with Christ in our everyday lives in the time of Lent, carrying to our crosses the glimpses of the divine that we might have encountered before on the mountaintops sometime in our worship or our spiritual experiences in life might begin to emerge again. Think of the quote on the front of the order of service from Marilyn Robinson. Wherever you turn your eyes, the world can shine like transfiguration. You don't have to bring a thing to it except a little willingness to see. Only who could have the courage to see it? Where do we see the small glimpses and snapshots, the small glimmers of the divine around us in our lives? In the beauty of a sunrise, maybe, or the flowers of spring in the garden, or the hand held by a loved one, the smile of a stranger. We should never underestimate, no matter how old we are as Christians, the power of Jesus to surprise us. And there is room here in this church, and indeed in all churches, not only for those who have been to the mountaintop and have seen that dazzling image, but also for those who have always felt that they were at base camp in the valley, feeling only God's absence. And room too for those who seek God from nowhere, perhaps calling us to change our whole concept of what church is, to put that front and center. As Steve Astorp said in his recent book, Rewilding the Church, Churches perceived as standing for certainty, dogma, and fixed practices are no place for spiritual pilgrims. But when church is understood as what emerges from an open-hearted journeying with Christ, we will find many fellow travelers beyond the circle of our existing congregations. So whether you feel like you're blinded by the dazzling light before you, or like you're pawing about in a power cut looking for a candle. 
Whether you feel your front row at Glastonbury with the Foo Fighters on the pyramid stage, or you're hearing the faintest of voices calling across the open fields, Jesus invites us now to come down the mountain and journey with him to the cross throughout Lent. What is it in the transfiguration that might make us set out on the route? Well, maybe it's that foretaste, the trailer, the glimpse of what is to come that Peter, James, and John saw at the top of the mountain in the Theophany. That glimmer draws us to the invitation to become part ourselves of the discipleship story, living by faith, trusting the one who promises, stepping out together onto the Jerusalem road for the full unveiling of what God is really up to is on the way ahead. Amen.
Let us pray. God of light and brightness, of love and grace, you made the world to be a wonderful place for us, a place of harmony and understanding, of peace and of justice. But it has fallen far from that, and often we are culpable. So we bring before you, God, some of the worries we have for others, being sure that you will hear us and that praying to you, you will act through us or with us to make things better. We pray for peace in countries where there is none. We especially pray for Ukraine and for Israel, Palestine for the innocent lives destroyed or damaged, and for futures that have been ruined. We pray for an end to the violence and for peace to return. And loving God of peace, we pray for the wider Middle East. As once again tensions rise, and the threat of widening conflict becomes more real. So we pray for calm. We pray for an end to provocation and retaliation. And we pray for an end to sectarianism and oppression. Instead, God, we pray for a new era of peace and justice and of truth and trust. And God of justice, we pray for those who have fled from the places they call home, for refugees trying to survive, to protect their families, to find peace or just a brighter future. For all those who walk thousands of miles or live in squalor, exploited, ignored and pushed from pillar to post, God, we pray for compassion and justice for them and for all places to once more become safe places to live and flourish and build family and life. And God, we pray for the whole world, for the climate now almost out of control, for people affected by flooded farmland, and disappearing islands and coastlines. We also pray for people affected by drought and famine, storms and extreme cold. God, we pray you would help us all to make any change we can, however small, to help to stabilize things once more. God, we pray finally for those we know or have seen who are struggling in one way or another. For people suffering from poor mental or physical health. For the exhausted and the abused. We pray for those whose lives are darkened by things that have happened to them in the past. For the grieving and the heartbroken but you are the God of light and love. So we pray that you would shine brightly for all to see. Bless and heal, calm and assure, and help us to know the best path to walk, to make your world the place you wanted it to be once more. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our final hymn, we worship together in song, praising God with something of the majesty of Jesus Christ, of his divinity that comes across not only in the transfiguration, but so often 
in Scripture and in our lives. It's number 459, Crown Him With Many Crowns. May God, the Creator's loving hand, keep us from stumbling. The footprints of Jesus give us confidence to follow, and the warmth of the Spirit keep us safe in our walk with God. And as we journey together through Lent, may the love of God, the blessing of God, walk alongside us when the road is rough, the road is bumpy, to lift us up and when we lead us to the joy of the resurrection of Easter Sunday, may we feel love in our hearts as we approach that place. May the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, be with each one of us and all whom we love, now and forevermore. <laughs> 